Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's on my list. thanks for being here today. Uh, you are at the uh, Office for the Advancement of Research's book talk on policing immigrants, local law enforcement on the front lines. So I'm guessing by the fact that you're all staying in your seats that you're in the right place, which is good. Uh, today's book talk features two of the authors of two of the four authors of this book. Uh, Doris Marie Provine, who is a professor emerita of justice and social inquiry at Arizona State University, and Monica Varsanyi, who is a professor of political science, a now full professor of political science here at John Jay College, and a professor of geography at the, at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, and criminal justice. And criminal justice. OK, good to know. Uh, this particular talk is very special to me because uh, Professor Varsanyi was a member of my own doctoral committee. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have both she and Professor Praveen here as foundational scholars in a, in a field that I would call crimmigration. They may not call it that, but I would call it that, which is the study of the many and increasing intersections between criminal justice and immigration policy, especially immigration enforcement. Uh, these two scholars approach the study from slightly different perspectives that turn out to be highly complementary. Professor Proveen, as a scholar, as a political scientist and a scholar of civic membership, and Professor Varsani as a geographer and a scholar of migration. The book they have written might be called Prophetic, given what's happened in the year since its release, uh, but it's really just good social science. The policies, practices, and attitudes that this book describes all took place during the Obama administration. What we have today is in many ways an extension and an enlargement of something that was built under previous administrations. And it's important not to forget that and think that what we're experiencing right now and we have experienced for the past year in terms of immigration policy is, is brand new. It is not. And I think, uh, I, I look forward to hearing what uh, Professor Varsanyi and Professor Praveen have to say about the ways that these policies and practices take place at the local level with local law enforcement. Let's welcome them all today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's really a delight to see all of you out there, especially some of my students who just suffered through a midterm like literally 15 minutes ago, so thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to start us off today by um, talking about how this project um, first came to be. Um, I was originally an assistant professor um, in the School of Justice and Social Inquiry at um, Arizona State University, where um, my colleague Marie was the director of the program. I hired her, wasn't that brilliant? <laughs> yeah, she hired me. Thank you, thank you. Um, and we couldn't figure out why we were at this meeting. We were just talking about it, but we were at a meeting in a church of various immigrants, and they were talking about this and that, and then one of the women, and then a few other people piped in as well, were discussing how they um, had difficulties driving to work in Phoenix, in the city of Phoenix, because as they drove to work, they had to drive through several jurisdictions. They had to drive through Maricopa County, as well as the city of Phoenix. And at this time, the city of Phoenix had more of what we might call a sanctuary kind of uh, orientation towards its immigrant population. So the local law enforcement, the local police in that city were not interested in doing immigration enforcement. But right outside of the city of Phoenix, we had Sheriff Joe Arpaio doing his thing in Maricopa County. And if any of you have not talk, uh, heard about Sheriff Joe Arpaio, we'll talk about him a little bit later. But suffice it to say, uh, he called himself America's toughest sheriff, and was sort of um, hung his reputation on being one of the toughest immigration enforcers in the country. Um, and he uh, lived up to that reputation to some level. So these women who were speaking at this meeting had to drive to work very conscious of whether they were dri literally driving through Maricopa County, the streets of Maricopa County, which is this, the county that Phoenix is located inside of, or whether they were driving through the streets of Phoenix, because depending on which city or, or jurisdiction they were driving in, they would be facing different law enforcement. And both of these, uh, both the Phoenix PD and uh, Maricopa County sheriffs had vastly different 
um, enforcement policies towards their immigrant communities. So this, this, we heard this and we thought, well, this is, this is very strange. We have two jurisdictions that are literally overlapping one another with vastly different immigration enforcement policies. And this is what kicked off this project. Um, now it's about 10 years ago, right? Um, shortly, after, shortly after we were at that meeting, we invited our co-authors to join the project, um, which is, who are Scott Decker and Paul Lewis. Um, I'm sorry they couldn't be here today. Um, and this project really got kicked off at a time when um, uh, the federal government, in, actually laws that were passed in 1996, enabled this, but it wasn't until the mid-2000s that um, the lo localities throughout uh, the country started to um, grow interested in participating in, at that time, what were called 287G agreements. And what 287G agreements were was this invitation by the federal government to localities, so cities, counties, et cetera, to start participating in immigration enforcement. But when this came about, sheriffs and police chiefs across the country, nobody knew what was going on. There was no kind of knowledge about how this was gonna impact communities, how this was gonna impact in law enforcement. Um, and a lot of people were asking questions, like should we do this, should we not do this, should we partner with the federal government, should we not partner with the federal government, we just don't know. So this is where this project got its origins, was in this moment, um, and particularly when we were um, living, uh, Marie still lives in Phoenix, but when I was living in Phoenix at the time. Um, so our three questions, where's our clicker here? Is this working? Is it not working? So when we developed this, um, this project, we had three basic um, guiding questions. And on the whole, this project was funded by a number of smaller sources, but on the, on the large, by an, um, two, uh, two National Science Foundation grants. Um, and uh, the questions that we put forward in our grant applications and that we tried to have motivate our research were the following. Um, how has local law enforcement responded to pressure, both from the federal government and from communities as well, as well to more actively engage in enforcing federal immigration law. So lots of local police, again, and sheriffs were not only facing pressures from the federal government to start doing this enforcement, and at the time this project started, this was under um, George W. Bush, and but very quickly after that, under um, President Obama. But also local communities were pressuring their, um, their law enforcement agencies to start getting involved in this realm. And again, they were wondering how is this gonna impact their law enforcement mandate and the, um, the communities that they lived in. Um, we were curious, just at a very basic level, to try to understand what approaches were being taken in this realm and why different approaches were being taken in different locations. Uh, why were certain communities deciding to do immigration enforcement, whereas other ones were rejecting it vehemently? And why were other uh, communities not really engaging at all in the issue? So where were, what were communities doing and why? And what were law enforcement agencies doing and why? And finally, um, you know, the sort of major question is what were the outcomes of this, uh, of the decisions that were being taken at the local level? If a community did decide to engage in immigration enforcement at the local level, what were the impacts on law enforcement and on immigrant communities in those places? If communities decided not to, like New York City, and to become uh, what are called, uh, I mean, they're called sanctuary ordinances with, with air quotes around them. Cities often prefer to be called non-cooperation cities or cities where there are non-cooperation ordinances. They're not cooperating with the federal government. Well, if they decide to do that, what then are the outcomes of this? So this was, these were the three major questions that were guiding our research um, in this project. Um, how have local, local law enforcement responded? What approaches were they taking and why? And then what were the outcomes of um, these decisions? And with that, I will hand it over to my um, wonderful colleague. Hey, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming here late in the afternoon. And I see a lot of students here. And one thing I've learned in my years of teaching is that students are often kind of reluctant to ask professors questions at events like this, especially when we're telling you all the stuff that we did research on. But I hope you will be thinking about things that you think are important that are related to this and be thinking about questions to ask us, because that happens to be my very favorite part of a presentation anyway, not so much telling you, but hearing what your questions are and responding as well as, as we can to them. So be thinking about saying something uh, soon. And let me just tell you how we're going to organize things. Monica and I are gonna kind of pass the baton back and forth, but we're gonna tell you a little bit about our findings and then uh, we're kind of starting with the large scale and moving to case studies, and then 
we'd like to get into implications and bring it up to now and what the Trump administration initiatives mean for what, uh, you know, how, how that kind of overlays what we did. Well, our biggest problem was figuring out how to do this research with four people and, uh, and a lot of questions that, as Monica said, hadn't really been fully formulated when we were starting to ask them. So what we decided to do was to try to uh, get a picture of the, the, what was going on at the national level and then get up close and personal with what, how communities were kind of coping and kind of learning some of the details. The only way to get the kind of national picture, you can't ask everybody, and things were up in the air. So we settled on asking police chiefs and sheriffs what they, what they were doing and what was going on in their departments. And as you can see from this slide here, we, uh, what, we went to cities that were large but not huge, like New York City is huge, okay, Chicago is huge. We stayed away from cities that were that large because we didn't think we could kind of comprehend what we needed to in our survey. But we were kind of looking at medium-sized cities and smaller cities. And then we, looked, uh, we did a, a third survey of sheriffs who are independently elected. So they're kind of in a different world of their own. They, they feel they have the mandate of the people to do what uh, they want to do in law enforcement. And that's one of the reasons Monica will tell you about the conflict between cities who choose their police chiefs, uh, usually kind of on professional credentials, and they do it with the city council, and sheriffs who get elected uh, by the public and they have whatever qualities they have. And that can sometimes be a source of, of conflict. So that's kind of how we did it. We, we did what I think was a good sampling technique. We, we went to places where there actually uh, were immigrants, and we were at a national level. And then we did a series of case studies that we'll tell you more about in just a little while. But I'm going to focus for a minute on the, uh, what the chiefs said and what the sheriffs said. And we, our first sort of series of questions was, well, how, how do you feel? Are you kind of like isolated from your community? Do you think that people in your city agree with what people in your department are saying? So we asked this, OK, what's the view in your department? What's the view in your city? And we looked to see if they were the same. So that's what you're going to see here. Now, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, but it's really a kind of a simple visual for you. The department is in the dark. You know, I just want to make sure it looked dark up there, too. That's uh, what the views are there. So just as this one is an example, our question was, unauthorized immigration is a controversial topic, emphasis on controversial, in my department or, chief, what do you think in your locality? Well, chiefs basically said, well, we don't think it's so controversial. We're on the, we disagree that it's controversial, but we think that they think it really is. So that's a pretty basic division between chiefs kind of saying, well, we, you know, we know what law enforcement is, but out there, they're really uh, up in the air about it and fighting about it. So there's a, uh, they're not on the same page, we could say. People believe it's relatively easy to determine who's into this, in this country without authorization. In the department, well, no, we haven't found it all that easy. So they disagree with that statement. But they think that outside in that larger community, people think that their job is pretty simple. And of course, it's not. But another major disagreement. Gaining the trust of unauthorized immigrants is a priority. In my department, well, yeah, they agree, maybe not quite so much. They don't see that the outside world thinks it's all that important. A responsibility of the federal government, you bet the local police, even this is in the early years before things really got to the level of tension that they are now, that there was a strong feeling from local police and sheriffs that, yeah, it darn well is a responsibility of the federal government. Don't give us one more job that we, uh, that we really can't handle uh, with the resources that we have. Again, the out their view is that the community doesn't quite get it, uh, doesn't get their dilemma. Did I miss one here? 
Um, I may have just missed a slide. How do you get, how do you go backwards? Maybe there is no going back. Yeah, okay, I got it. Um, okay, this is an interesting finding that we had. So we asked our chiefs and sheriffs, well, well what kind of community do you, do you live in? What's your, what are, the, what are the politicians in your community say? Well, as you can see, very few uh, places are what are known as a sanctuary community back in those days. There's uh, more support for a don't ask, don't tell approach. Um, and then some encouragement of support uh, of, of cooperation with uh, federal immigration agents. Um, but look at the, what's the really big one here? No policy at all. In other words, police departments and sheriffs were kind of navigating without controls. They were out in the, kind of in the, in the dark about what they were being asked to do by the people. And, and remember, police chiefs are chosen by their city council. So in a sense, the boss hadn't told them yet what, uh, what it wanted. It kind of, as we did this research, we felt more and more compassion for chiefs trying to figure out where they were supposed to be in this issue that was becoming hotter and hotter. Uh, it's kind of like you know the proverbial frog in the water that's coming closer and closer to a boil. They were kind of like the frogs in this water that was getting hotter and hotter. Well, this next slide uh, gives you an idea of what might have been happening on the ground. Now, I have to warn you, we didn't actually interview uh, frontline officers about, well, what do you do, Joe or Jose, when you encounter someone you suspect might be undocumented? We asked chiefs to estimate what their officers were doing. So there's a little wiggle room in there. But this is a really interesting finding. We, we constructed a kind of a, a, a series of questions. This is a, a summary here. And we started out with the kind of case where, you know, you would think, you would want to let immigration know if you thought you had an unauthorized immigrant who was arrested for a violent crime. And indeed, um, in both large cities and small cities, um, most would report to federal immigration authorities that they had such a person in their custody. Um, the same thing, a little bit less so with a parole violation. And it works on down to um, interviewed as a crime victim, complainant, or witness, and there very few think that their officers would call immigration authorities. Now, what's interesting to us about this is that it's a sliding scale. In other words, at least from the point of view of, of chiefs and sheriffs, they believe their officers are ex exercising discretion in what might be called a humane way. In other words, you don't rush to the phone when you've got a victim of a crime because you suspect that victim might be um, not have papers, but if it's someone who's really a danger to the community, well then, gee, it might be convenient to have federal immigration authorities uh, know about that and, and uh, deal with that person too. They kind of see it as a way of moving violent people out of the community. Uh, it's a reminder, and this is gonna be a theme that we come back to in our discussion today, that there is a huge amount of discretion at the individual level. Essentially, what the immigration system was for about the 100 years or so that it actually operated, because we didn't really have one until after the Civil War, so I'm kind of talking you know, um, uh, slightly more recent times, was a pretty porous thing in which the federal immigration law was tough, but the interior enforcement uh, that, you know, in other words, not on the borders, was pretty haphazard. There were very few agents assigned to that. And local police, if they had somebody they really didn't want in the community, somebody they thought might be working with the mafia, for example, they might contact federal immigration authorities. But it was a pretty uh, Swiss cheese kind of system for the longest time. And it's really hard to kind of think about that now because we, talk so much about immigration enforcement, but it hasn't been a major topic for most of our history. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time. This is one that's important though that I'm showing you now. One of the questions we asked was, well, okay, police chiefs and sheriffs, 
you have a policy, you have something written down about how to deal with these interactions with people who you suspect might be um, unauthorized immigrants with the federal government kind of encouraging you to be involved. And the, uh, the number that you really want to look at is the third one down, have no policy. Large cities, 51%, smaller cities, 61%. And if you added to that, have unwritten practices, which is um, not what I would call much of a policy, that number is even higher. That percentage is higher. It's relatively few. It's a distinct minority that had any policy at all directed to this issue. So I think our initial finding that people didn't know what was going on was true. And it would be true for police officers, too. OK, um, we're getting to the case studies at this point. So let me just kind of sum up what this little piece of, of our findings was, is that first of all, individual police officers and sheriff's deputies had a lot of power to decide what to do, whether, for example, to issue a citation or an arrest in a situation. If you issue an arrest, if you, if you take someone in and they're booked, then there, the, as procedures developed over the period that we looked at, um, you were, the person ran a much higher risk of deportation. If you issue a citation, um, this is John Jay Criminal, School of Criminal Justice, you know that that means you have to appear in court and you have to pay, probably have to pay a fine, and nobody's going to be asking you about your immigration status. So citation versus arrest is a really important decision. Or letting nothing go, at, you know, letting, letting the person go, talking your way out of it. Um, that's another possibility. Yeah, in the back. Did you find that uh, these instances where they have no uh, written policies seep over to other uh, practices in policing, or just specifically where they were policing the immigrant population? Well, it was interesting. We did ask whether they had a policy on uh, racial profiling. and. 98%, I think it was, or 97% said, well, yes, we do. So they do have policies on some of what you might call the issues of the day. But that was very much understood to be black versus white as opposed to immigrant versus non-immigrant. So we, what we were isolating was a confusion about immigration rather than a kind of a lackadaisical attitude about policies in general. But that's a great question. OK, why don't, we, uh, why don't we go into our case studies, and then we'll come back. OK. So as, um, as Marie mentioned, we did, um, uh, we did three national surveys. And those were some of the results that she was just, just discussing. But part of what we also did was that we actually traveled to seven different cities and did in-depth field work in those particular cities and talked with a whole variety of people, ranging from police chiefs, rank and file officers when we had access to them, um, community leaders, um, religious community leaders, a whole variety of folks. Um, so in our, in our case studies, uh, we found a variety of things, but the one particular finding that I want to share with you today is what we call, um, we call a jurisdictional patchwork. Uh, in its longer form, we call it a multi-layered jurisdictional patchwork. Now, what does that mean? Um, we have three different cities that I wanted to tell you about today to tell you what that jurisdictional patchwork means. And what the jurisdictional patchwork basically is is this sort of, um, just to give you sort of a, a, a preview of what I'm just about to talk about, it's just the, essentially that, that jurisdictions across the country um, are all taking on different approaches to this immigration enforcement issue. So there's cities that take different approaches that are both either pro-immigrant or anti-immigrant or enforcement or, or non-enforcement. There's counties that take on pro-enforcement versus non-enforcement. There are states that take on non-enforcement and enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. And then the federal government kind of laying over the, the top of the whole thing. But what's so interesting about it is that across the country, you get jurisdictions butting up right against each other, on top of each other, et cetera, et cetera, with competing policies. So we basically get this kind of like patchwork effect of, of enforcement across the entire country. Um, the first case study that I wanted to tell you about today was, is um, the city of Mesa, Arizona. Mesa, Arizona um, is something like the 40th largest city in the country, isn't it, if, by population? So it's bigger than Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah, it's bigger than Minneapolis. Who knew, right? Mesa, Arizona. It's in Maricopa County. Maricopa County, actually, where Phoenix is, Phoenix, Arizona, 
is something like the fourth largest county in the country, population-wise. So these are pretty substantial places. Um, Mesa, Arizona, um, this is back in sort of the late 2000s, 2008, 2009. Um, the, um, the police chief in Mesa was uh, a man named George Gascon. He went on later to become, he's now currently the, um, the DA um, in um, San Francisco, the city of San Francisco. Um, he brought to Mesa, Arizona, a fairly uh, sort of um, pro-immigrant, uh, non-immigration non enforcement stance to the city. And um, that was what the police in the city of Mesa were working very hard on communicating to its communities when, um, it, in 2008, um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who again was the elected sheriff of Maricopa County around that, you know, within which Mesa is located, um, showed up at City Hall one midnight um, with all of, of his officers dressed in riot gear and then broke into City Hall and conducted sort of an immigration raid on the janitorial staff that was working at Mesa City Hall. Sheriff Joe had not notified uh, anybody in the Mesa City government that this was gonna happen. So this became a very uh, sort of dangerous moment where there might have been misunderstanding between the two law enforcement agencies. And obviously people and the government in Mesa were very, very upset about this kind of, um, um, this lack of communication on Sheriff Joe's part with the city of Mesa. Um, normally, when you have a county and a city in a county, there's a principle of comity where sheriffs do not, they sort of unofficially agree to not police within the cities in the county. So they police within unincorporated territories in the county, but not within the city. But in this case, Sheriff Joe took it upon himself to go ahead and police throughout the entire county, including in cities that had their own policing policies vis-a-vis -vis immigrants. So you get basically, in this case, a situation in which Mesa is a fairly, um, I, wouldn't call it, I wouldn't have called it like a sanctuary city, but sort of a, um, a, a non-compliant city with regards to immigration enforcement, and a city that was trying to reach out to its immigrant communities and let them know that the police were there to help them and be part of the whole you know, situation of public safety. And then, at the same time, Maricopa County Sheriff Joe having one of the most aggressive anti-immigrant campaigns in the country. Um, so you get, again, two layers right on top of each other with very, very, very different um, opposing policies to immigration, which again leads to a situation where um, the, even though Mesa tried to push a sort of pro-immigrant agenda with its immigrant communities, um, they were afraid of the sheriff coming in and policing in the county. So Mesa wasn't really able to put into place a policy that it felt was important for its communities, uh, its communities within, the, within the city. Um, a different kind of dynamic is something that we found in Raleigh, North Carolina. In Raleigh, North Carolina, the city of Raleigh, again, the police, did not have an enforcement-oriented uh, approach towards their immigrant communities. They had more of a sanctuary sort of policy of sorts. Um, however, Wake County, which is the county in which Raleigh is located, did have, um, at the time, what's called a 287G agreement, so that when, when uh, immigrants were arrested and brought into jails, they were checked through immigration databases, okay? So if an immigrant was arrested and brought into the county jail, they would have their information checked through the immigration databases and potentially be subject to deportation depending on what their immigra immigration record would say. So what, what happened in Raleigh was an interesting thing that we call dual deniability. Raleigh police could arrest somebody and say, well, we don't have an immigration enforcement policy. We're not doing immigration enforcement. We're not paired up with the federal government. We're just arresting this person. But what happens when you arrest somebody is they go to the county jail. So in the county jail, the county could say, we didn't arrest them. We're just doing our job. We're just, we're just uh, processing them through the immigration database. So they were sort of saying, well, we're not the arresting parties here. The city was saying, we're not processing them through databases. They're in the count, that's happened in the county. So both agencies were kind of not really claiming responsibility. But what this left was wide open possibility for racial profiling on the part of local officers. Officers could, if they sort of wanted to, arrest somebody and then know that they would be screened for immigration violations once they got to the jail. So you see this kind of situation happening. We'll talk a little bit about this later, but this is what you kind of can see today with um, what's called Secure Communities, which is now coming back under um, our current um, administration, presidential administration. And then a oh, last up, 
is the cities of New Haven, Connecticut, and East Haven, Connecticut. Um, New Haven, Connecticut actually um, has a very, this is where Yale University is. Um, it has one of the most progressive sort of immigration policies of many cities in the country. It was the first city in the country to have a municipal ID. Now, do you guys have your New York ID cards? Does anybody have a New York ID card? Anybody? Anybody? A few people. Go out and get them. They're great. <laughs> so New York actually took the lead of New Haven to create these cards. So it's a very sort of pro-immigrant place. They realized that immigrants were basically coming home from work, um, oftentimes with lots of cash in their pockets, because when they didn't, when immigrants didn't have a, a, a kind of ID, they couldn't open bank accounts, and therefore um, various uh, unsavory elements were learning that immigrants were walking home from work with lots of cash in their pockets, and immigrants were getting robbed at very high rates. They didn't have access to bank accounts, so the city said, "We need to do something about this." We need to get an ID for these immigrants so that they can open bank accounts and then not be robbed on their way home from work, basically, <laughs> or have their homes robbed where they're holding lots of cash. So the city came up with these, immigrant, these uh, municipal ID cards, which are available to everybody in the community. Simultaneous to that, the police uh, put forward a policy, a general order, which was sort of a sanctuary policy. We're not going to do immigration enforcement. Well, 36 hours after um, the general order was passed, um, ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, conducted its first raid in New Haven, ever. And this was seen by many to be retaliation for this very pro-immigrant policy. Um, so we have the federal government, in this case, coming up at odds with the local city government, and also from, um, uh, and in two other ways, also rank-and-file police officers that we interviewed were also not, not all of them were super happy about this general order, which prevented them from doing immigration enforcement. So we also have sort of rank and file discontent about this particular policy. And then thirdly, um, the city of East Haven, which is right next to New Haven, had a very, very anti-immigrant uh, local government. And they actually would park police uh, cruisers on the border between the two states, uh, between the two cities, and call this border patrol. And if immigrants would drive into East Haven, they would start harassing them and hassling them and so forth, potentially arresting them again and then bringing them into a situation where they might be screwed. based on all of this, um, to, to echo what we've said already, federal, the federal government lacks sufficient interior resources to have some kind of uniform policy across the whole country. Um, it just doesn't have the money to have off, ICE officers everywhere across the country, which is why they started reaching out to states and localities uh, in the mid-2000s to start to become a quote-unquote a force multiplier in this issue, to kind of join them in the immigration um, enforcement situation. Because local police forces have autonomy, um, you see this huge diversity of approaches based on local needs. Again, some places pro-enforcement, some places anti-enforcement, and everything in between. Overlapping, next to each other, you name it. We saw everything out there. It was very, it's very much a patchwork of local responses. Within that, like the Raleigh case study and also in, in the New Haven case study, um, you see police officer discretion playing a very important role. We all know that police officers have a great deal of discretion in doing their jobs. Um, no less the case in immigration enforcement. And in that case, you can also have officers that are pro-immigrant or that are working very hard to become um, friends of the immigrant community and to gain their trust. On the flip side, you can see police officers that, um, are, that practice racial profiling and um, arrest people on pretextual grounds just to bring them in and know that they're going to be screened for immigration violations. Simultaneous to that, we see sanctuary cities growing across the country, and that's become much more of a, a phenomenon since we started this research. And communities really acting independently from one another and not coordinating with each other at all. 
So this, I, we also did a case study in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And Allentown is a city in Pennsylvania, and the cities that were a city that was two cities away, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, had a completely different policy. They never talked to each other. The police chiefs never really coordinated about any of this stuff. Just they weren't talking to each other at all on these things. They were all sort of related to their local needs. And what you see then, um, and then I'll turn it over to Marie again, is a um, fear of um, uh, basically the anti-immigrant pro-enforcement policy wins out at the end of the day. Because if you're, in, if you're an immigrant, and even if you think your local police force doesn't do immigration enforcement or doesn't police immigrants, if you're not sure, what are you going to do? You're going to err on the safe side, right? You're going to not talk to the police if you think there's any chance that talking to the police will get you deported. So what happens with this confusing patchwork of policies is, generally speaking, a growing distrust of law enforcement. And if you have a growing distrust of law enforcement, you, it threatens public safety. So in fact, communities that have sort of a sanctuary orientation, in general, um, are, are much better at upholding public safety for all community members, which is very much opposite of what the um, Trump administration is arguing about sanctuary cities. Um, we found very much that they are a place where public safety is enhanced, not threatened. Would you like to? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Oh, these are, uh, these were our recommendations. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that, you know, we haven't used the word community policing here, but back in the day before the talk was all about sanctuary cities, the debate, I'm going to, I just want to scroll back here for just a moment to kind of um, put this in context, and then um, that helps understand what um, we're seeing right now. So back in 1996, Congress, as Monica alluded to, wanted to have the, the federal immigration authorities have a little help from the local level because they didn't want to spend the money, but they wanted more enforcement. So the idea is force multipliers. We'll get local law enforcement. They can be like the junior people that make the arrest, and then we'll take over from there. We'll make all the decisions, but they can bring us people. And that was the 287G program. It was called that because that's where it fit in the United States Code. Well, the odd thing was nobody wanted to do it. You know, it was 1996. Nobody signed up until after the World Trade Center uh, attacks and the attacks on the Pentagon. So 2003 is the first sign-ups. And even then, only like 60 at most uh, uh, police departments or sheriff's departments signed up for this program of getting to be like the junior immigration officers. And there are like 18,000 of them, uh, these departments in the United States. So it was like not popular. And so the, uh, when the Obama administration came into power, they, you know, it was pretty, uh, they, he, he chose our, my former governor, Janet Napolitano. Well, Janet Napolitano, when she was our governor, she'd always say, Immigration enforcement is a federal responsibility. We in Arizona shouldn't be doing it. And she kind of held back the pro-enforcement people for a number of years with that argument. So Obama puts her in the federal government, and she said, well, I'm here to do that job. So she came up with the Secure Communities Program. And this is, um, this is all very relevant to what we're uh, seeing right now. So what is Secure Communities? Well, that, you know, since nobody signed up to help be the junior partners, 287G seem to be kind of dead. Why not instead have all the information from booking go to the federal government, and then all the police have to do is simply detain people that, um, that fail the are you a legal immigrant test, and then ICE will, within a couple of days, pick them up. So this was like so efficient, such a good idea. So that rolled out. It also wasn't very popular, but it also um, was pretty hard to avoid. It wasn't like something where you had to sign up to be trained. So that was rolled out. Well, interestingly, uh, and not surprisingly, probably for any of you who study racial justice issues, you would be like, I already knew this. There was a lot of problem with pretextual stops and racial profiling. And this was well understood by people who studied this. You know, they counted the arrests, 
and they looked at this. And it meant that in this kind of dragnet of trying to be helpers to the federal government, there was a lot of racial discrimination going on. Well, the Obama administration, to its credit, eventually ended those programs because of that. And my own Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County, who was really an outrageously um, active racial profiler, played a big part in that. He was an embarrassment to a federal government that didn't want to have a charge of, of racial discrimination held against it. So Obama rolled that back. Now, what we're seeing now, I'm just going to skip ahead here to um, the next slide, if I can. How to make this, oh, it's going to kind of reinforce all that. Federal policy under Trump. Can I make that come? Oh, it's going to be coming in. I'm just going to put these all down here. Because it's kind of a, I think that's all of them on this. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a package that we're seeing. And we're seeing a revival of both 287G and secure communities. Now, this is something you should really pay attention to because we already know, we already know to a certainty that these programs are racially discriminatory. We already know that. It's, it's kind of like already in the can. And so their revival is a signal of something. In the same way that back in Phoenix, um, when it was about 115 degrees, um, our president came to Phoenix to give a talk. And um, that was right about the time, or not, yeah, he came and said, I'm, you know, everything's going to be all right with, with Sheriff Joe. It's going to be fine. And he pardoned this guy, who this sheriff, who had been found guilty of racial profiling. That was another signal of a shift in policy. Uh, the fact that uh, President Trump has uh, created a shame and blame list. Now, this almost everything that's uh, that's on this list has run into some interesting problems. Uh, certainly, the 287G and Secure Communities Revival, have, they haven't gotten off the ground, but there's going to be problems with the fact that um, we know how they work. Um, the uh, grant forfeitures idea that if you don't actually comply with what the immigration authorities want, we're going to withhold your grant funding that comes from the federal level, that has uh, run into lawsuits as well. The name and shame list is one of the to me, one of the most amusing ones. These are communities that say, you know what? We're not going to help you enforce immigration law because we want, as Monica just um, explained, we want our communities to feel safe to report crime, to, um, to if you're a witness to crime, to report what you've seen, and to generally trust your police department or your sheriff's office. And so uh, those communities let that be known and so the idea was that there was going to be, every week, a list of communities that weren't cooperating with the federal government. So they started putting out the list. And of course, they made a lot of mistakes. And so these communities would write and say, you got that wrong. We, we shouldn't be on the name and shame list. And so it got so awkward and embarrassing, they've temporarily suspended, suspended that. Uh, I, I think I would really have to conclude on the uh, on, on the difference between the Obama administration that was interested in enforcement for a long time. You know, we have the um, DACA program and the, and the DAPA program. Who came, that came at the end of a two-term administration. For years, the Obama administration was upping the enforcement machinery. And what President Trump did was walk right into those shoes and take it further and pretty much just say, I'm not worried about the racial profiling part. I'm not worried about race discrimination. Let's just go with this. It's more important that we cover this, this mandate. Um, what we are seeing is more pushback than we have ever had because of this. The whole thing has become so much more salient than probably any police chief in the United States would like for it to be, and pretty much any sheriff would like for it to be, because they are really caught in the middle. The evidence is that public safety is greater if you don't 
involve local police and immigration enforcement. And it's pretty obvious why, because you can't have a whole segment of the community terrified of the police and have a safe community for everybody. On the other hand, the pressure is really on these departments and sheriffs to cooperate with a kind of a law and order uh, policy. And so they would really prefer not to have this be the issue of the day, to not even have John Jay want to have a talk about our research, to, have, to just shut the whole thing down and not talk about it anymore. But that's not the situation. And what we are also seeing is a real lineup with a kind of uh, fervor on one part of, 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 you know, basically the Republican Party is dividing itself on this issue. And my evidence there is a very interesting senator. How many of you have heard of Senator Flake? It's not exactly a household expression, but it is funny because Jeff Flake, the senator, is from Snowflake because his family had been in this part of Arizona for so long that it was the snows and the flakes that founded Snowflake. And so Flake is from Snowflake, but then Flake flaked, as those of you who know uh, about Senator Flake's recent resignation, saying, I'm not going to be uh, running again uh, for Congress, for Senate. Well, the backstory on that is a, a few months before he published his um, book attacking the current administration, he wrote a long op-ed about how he grew up in Snowflake on a ranch, and his very best mentor and friend was an undocumented immigrant, a man a few years older than, than him, who had illegally crossed the border something like 11 times to help the flakes on their farm in Snowflake. And, and young Jeff you know, got all sorts of advice, and they, they put up fences together and stuff like that. That was the old bipartisan agricultural business alliance that kept this whole issue of enforcement tamped down so that pretty much, as Monica said, you could have a patchwork of places that uh, didn't want to enforce immigration law, but you could talk tough about it and sort of nothing, not too much would happen. The Obama administration actually really changed that, and we've seen this become a kind of an issue of right-wing populism in the current administration. And I would really defend that as right-wing populism of just not caring about the consequences of this policy that is, in fact, quite popular with a lot of Americans and a lot of voters. But remember Senator Flake, because he was the old school that is, you know, he's not running for a re-election because he might not get re-elected, but also maybe because he truly is disgusted with the whole thing. But that old alliance of farmers and business people um, managed to keep the border pretty porous for a long time. And that is, uh, that's, that's now history. Where we go from here is really uncertain. Um, I did want to mention, and I know we're kind of out of time, so I'm, not, I'm just going to say it quickly. There are a lot of cities and counties and even states that are pushing back in the courts and politically against these policies that we're seeing now. So the whole thing is uh, going to be up in the air for a few years about how, how, how it's going to come out legally. But in terms of the mood of the country, I think we're as divided as we've ever been on this issue. I want to thank you all very much for coming today and for putting